The world is a big and beautiful place. It's also a very old place, depending who you ask. But I didn't always think so. So today we're going to look at some of the big pictures that helped to change my mind. A couple of them are of Earth, but most of them are actually of outer space. They are, in my opinion, some of the most intriguing images ever created. In fact, when I first saw them, I was so impressed that they changed the way that I look at the universe ever since. Okay, here's the first picture. It's a complete topographical map of the surface of the Earth, courtesy of the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. The most prominent features are the continents and mountain ranges. Guess what the largest mountain range on Earth is. Go ahead, guess. Nope, you're wrong. It's the mid-ocean ridge. What ocean is it in the middle of, you ask? All of them. All of the world's oceans are connected by a vast and massive underwater mountain range, which begins in the Arctic and stretches all the way around the world, down the Atlantic, through the Indian Ocean, and around the Pacific Ocean, and ending right here on the west coast of North America. It outlines many of the borders of the Earth's tectonic plates, and it marks the boundary where magma is constantly forming new ocean floor, and it's over 40,000 miles long. You might have even seen this picture before and only ever really looked at the shape of the land. You might notice, for instance, that South South America and Africa fit together like the pieces of a puzzle. There are a bunch of other ways that you can see coastlines fitting together. But what really struck me about this image was the ocean floor. It's beautiful. Those interlocking shapes you see on the coastline are actually echoed again on the ocean floor. They're everywhere and they all have these great stress lines running perpendicularly as if they were stretch marks on a pregnant Mother Earth. They're like great big thousand mile long arrows pointing to the continents and saying, hey, look at those huge pieces of land. Guess what? They used to be right next to each other. I think the first time that I saw these mountains was actually in Google Earth, not too long after that came out. The mid-ocean ridge wasn't even discovered until the 1950s, so there are lots of people still alive now who were born at a time when no one knew what the largest mountain range on the Earth really was. They had never seen it before. If you want, you can go and visit it. Pack your bags for Thingvellir National Park in Iceland to see where the Earth is cracking apart and new land is being formed. You can even go down into the rift and do some snorkeling. Since it's out in the Atlantic Ocean, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge cuts right through it, which is why it has so many awesome volcanoes. Here's another image from NOAA, or rather, it's the same image, but it includes all the data we have on the age of the rocks on the ocean floor. We're able to tell the age of the rock because new rock on Earth is slightly radioactive. The isotopes of the elements that make up the rocks have natural ratios. And as the rock ages, the isotopes with more energy turn one by one into daughter elements and at the same time emit a little burst of radiation. This process is called radioactive decay. And it begins immediately, but gradually slows down as the energy in the rock's atoms is depleted. The farther away from the mid-ocean ridge the rock is, the fewer fewer radioactive isotopes we find in it. This is the best view that we have of Andromeda, which is our closest galactic neighbor. Like our home, the Milky Way, it's a spiral galaxy. This is actually a composite of many photographs taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. The Andromeda Galaxy is an object. Let's talk for a second about what an object is. An object is a collection of matter whose parts have a causal relationship to one another. At the very least, the parts of an object affect one another in a way that allows it to remain a whole. Andromeda is held together by gravity. It is shaped by gravity. But if the universe were 6,000 years old, we couldn't even call Andromeda an object. At this point, light from one end of Andromeda would have only made it less than 3% of the way across. So if we assume that Andromeda has not had billions of years in which to form, there's no reason for it to have a dense, brilliant core. No reason for it to have spiral arms. In that case, the stars are still almost exactly where God originally put them. And Andromeda is not really an object. It's just a picture. One more thing about Andromeda before we move on. It's heading right for us. 
It's expected to collide and combine with the Milky Way in about 4 billion years. Here's what that might look like. This is a picture of two other galaxies colliding. It's just one of many examples of galactic collision photographed by Hubble. Notice the trail of stars and gas suspended between the two bodies. Also, you can see a disturbance of the outer areas of each galaxy on their opposite sides. These are stars that have been pulled into higher and more eccentric orbits around their galactic core by passing close to the other galaxy hundreds of millions of years ago. Let's zoom out a bit. We're here on Earth, which is one of the planets orbiting the Sun as part of our solar system. Many of the larger stars we see in the sky are part of our local interstellar neighborhood, which is just a small part of the Milky Way galaxy, which is part of the same local group as Andromeda and the Triangulum Galaxy. That group is just one part of the Virgo supercluster. Now this is the scale at which things begin to stop clustering because the accelerating expansion of the universe has overpowered gravity. If we zoom out even further and look at many superclusters, things begin to look very homogeneous. The largest objects we know of, such as the Great Sloan Wall, are grand filaments of superclusters. If we zoom out again so that even our Virgo supercluster looks like a tiny spot, we can see what the entire observable universe might look like. It's big. Now this isn't a real photograph, and our universe wouldn't look like this from the outside. This is just an approximate representation of the universe relative to our particular place in space-time. Let's look at some images of real data. This is the two-degree field redshift survey. It's an image produced by mapping the redshift of all the light sources in two regions of the sky. The Earth is at the center here. By measuring how redshifted light is, we can determine its distance from us. Notice how the galaxies in this image that are close to us are arranged into clusters and filaments like one big cosmic web. But farther out, matter is scattered somewhat randomly. That's because the light we are receiving from the edge of the observable universe is very old. Closer to us, gravity has had time to pull matter together into structures leaving huge cosmic voids with relatively less matter. These are just two regions of the sky that are shaped kind of like two wings attached to the Earth. Here's a three-dimensional view of one of them. Based on these observations, we can estimate how much gravity and matter are out there in the universe, as well as exactly how old the universe is. These numbers let us run simulations that represent a working model for how large structures behave in our universe. There's simply not enough mass contributed by the visible matter we see to account for all the gravity in the universe. However, by mapping the effects of gravity, gravity which pull galaxies together, we can figure out where the dark matter is. This is the very first 3D map of the universe showing dark matter. Here's how you should read it. The axis running from left to right is distance from the Earth. So the left side is where Earth is right now, and the right side is the edge of the observable universe, and also the beginning of time. The other two dimensions in the map are just polar coordinates relative to Earth, so you can think of them like latitude and longitude mapped onto the sky. And what we see here is a similar story. Dark matter is scattered far away and in the past, and as time progresses we see more and more structure as dark matter pools into clusters and filaments. Dark matter is the reason we have enough gravity for galaxies to form at all. Okay, that's it for me. If you want to have at it in the comments, I'm all yours, but I have a couple of ground rules first. I myself have said things on both sides of this debate that I regret. I wish I could unsay them, but I can't. So think carefully and calmly before you comment. Rule two, if you have a point to make, make it with an image. If you get into a debate, the debater with no images automatically is the loser. Not a hokey diagram, an image with real data in it. It's been great talking to you. My name has been Eric. Thanks for watching.